many of our ways of understanding, what we think and what we think things mean, are expressed through aphorisms that draw on our sense of sight. And that's just in English. As we know all too well, our understanding of the world is shaped by our own subjective perspective, the way we see things and how we interpret what we saw. If we want others to understand our viewpoints and the meanings we interpret, we need to know how to provide supporting evidence. Because if anything is obvious in our hypermedia saturated lives, we can't rely on the idea that we all see things the same way. In learning to think carefully and critically about what we see in a film, and then translating those observations into meaningful interpretations that can be understood by others as convincing and legitimate analyses, we first have to retrain ourselves to actually look at what we see. While this seems like an obvious task if we equate looking with seeing and seeing with understanding, the path from looking to understanding is complex and requires focused attention. In other words, it's one thing to watch a movie, but it's another thing to actually see it. In this first video, we will learn to start seeing mise-en-scene as a first step in learning formal film analysis, which does not mean fancy film analysis, but rather analyzing film with attention to film form, its shape, texture, and construction. A French term, mise-en-scene translates literally into English as placement in a scene, but in film studies, we just use the original French term rather than a translation. Historically, mise-en-scene refers to everything physically on set that is to be filmed by the camera. So this would include the set and setting, props, animals, actors, staging or blocking, costumes, makeup, aspects of lighting including shadows or darkness, and even colors. What we end up seeing on screen before the game-changing shift to CGI and digital filmmaking is the direct result of a series of choices by filmmakers that involve a physicality of design, arrangement, and framing. These decisions, most of which are as controlled and intentional as possible, result in what we call mise-en-scene. While it's easy to see and understand mise-en-scene if you're physically on a film set, as spectators encountering the final product, it can be more of a challenge to understand that what we see is the result of a complex and detailed series of choices, especially when those choices are crafted to create a sense of realism that is meant to trick us into thinking the film world and film events are natural and not highly constructed at all. But of course they are. The importance of mise-en-scene and its role in creating film worlds is most clear when we consider the content of early cinema pioneers. Like elsewhere, many early Japanese films focused on documenting existing theatrical performances and famous stage productions. Filmmakers would set up a camera in front of existing theater backdrops to capture the action head on, often in a single take. Actors performed as they would for a live audience in the very same costumes with the same props and executing the same staging and dialogue they would normally. In these early films, Directors quite literally adopted the mise-en-scene, or the placement of a scene, from the carefully constructed artifice of stage theater, in which very little is natural, and, unless something goes terribly wrong, everything is meant to be seen by the audience and has been placed by decision. Although film quite quickly outgrew a stationary, straightforward, and single perspective, the decisions and creation of mise-en-scene as the foundation of film production remains to this day equally intentional and carefully determined. Training ourselves to see the design and arrangement of mise-en-scene is crucial for understanding film as works of art and a mode of meaning making, as something that can be made to convey ideas rather than just something that happened to be captured by the camera. Once you start to understand that what you see was an intentional result of almost countless choices by a team of people, then you'll start to understand how films have and make meaning, both intentionally and subconsciously. Meaning and how meaning is made is after all what we aim to analyze. As spectators who don't have access to the experience of the original set, it's useful to think of mise-en-scene as everything that can be seen within the film frame. So again, this would include things like set and setting, props, animals, actors, staging or blocking, costumes, makeup, aspects of lighting, and colors. In contemporary film, it is getting harder by the minute to discern digital effects 
from physical mise-en-scene. But most of film history as yet predates the advent of digital technology in which careful arrangement of the material world shaped what we see or what we saw on screen. Moreover, this is still true for many films outside the robust and moneyed industries of Hollywood and related North American production centers. Actors engage with each other and the set in a physical way through their costumes and makeup and staging that informs and inspires their performances. After all, acting is in large part a performance of reacting. So too do choices about costume, makeup, lighting, props, and color have an impact on both performance and the way a story is told. Additionally, if we decenter our thinking of stories and meaning from a focus on human movement and action, in some films, setting and scenery are the actors that tell stories through a similar yet distinct physicality. Now, when most of us watch a movie, we follow the action. And actually, that's often what we're supposed to do. Most films are structured around the flow of action and encourage us to follow movement, which helps us to follow the plot. There's a reason why films were often called moving pictures in many languages, including Japanese. Films are pictures in motion, and these pictures in motion tell a story. Because we're so used to following the action of a story as a sequence of events, it takes effort and focus to start seeing mise-en-scene that is not only the action, but also forms and shapes action from the peripheries. So let's start with a simple exercise. Looking at this still image, what do you see inside the frame? Take a moment to pause this video and start writing down every aspect of the mise-en-scene that you can. And remember that includes set and setting, props, animals, actors, staging or blocking, costumes, makeup, aspects of lighting, and colors. So seriously, pause and notate as much as you can. Continue the video when you're done. We'll be here. So how did you do? Did you pay attention to the many aspects of the mise-en-scene just within this one frame? Maybe you overexcelled and found more attributes than we did by example. But if you fell far short, start pushing yourself to see more and be more thorough. For the next exercise, we'll take things up a notch. This time, we'll consider a short scene with multiple shots. The scene will run three times. As you watch, try to notate as many elements of the mise-en-scene as you can, just as you did for the still image. After the third time, go back in the video and replay them again to take even more notes. You might even pause as you go to give yourself some time to write.
Undoubtedly, this is harder and it is more difficult to focus on everything that is in the frame when the contents are in motion and there are cuts that distract your attention to follow the action. So part of the challenge is to train ourselves to start seeing the details of mise-en-scene and to likewise take note of them. It is key to practice writing down your observations, documenting what you see and what drew your attention, especially when you first start out in the practice of formal film analysis. That said, while all aspects of mise-en-scene are important because they are the result of choices, in terms of meeting making, some parts of the mise-en-scene are, well, more meaningful than others. So this is the next step, determining which of your observations of and about mise-en-scene help us understand the meanings of a film. As you sort through your careful notes, you might ask yourself, how does the mise-en-scene inform character? How does it create a sense of time and place? How about mood and emotion? How does it shape themes or enhance the narrative? Are there certain patterns in the mise-en-scene that lead to interpretive ideas? Are there ways that the mise-en-scene disrupts expectations? How does the mise-en-scene build an artificial sense of realism that relies on norms and cultural assumptions? Now this last question in particular also helps us to see how film operates as a cultural apparatus and opens this up to even bigger questions, such as what visual norms, shortcuts, or stereotypes do filmmakers take for granted when they design their stories? Once you start to see mise-en-scene, to observe the choices set before the camera, to learn how to express those observations, to make connections to larger ideas of meaning, you are well on your way to engaging with formal film analysis. But this is still just the beginning. After all, it's one thing to arrange things in front of a camera, but it's yet another thing to use that camera itself.